All right, I think we will get started. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining. Good afternoon from wherever you are calling or dialing in from. Um, we want to welcome you to the first Terminal AMA uh, hosted today by Carrie McKinney and with our featured guest, Darren Murph. Um, a few housekeeping items that I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of. Uh, first, I want to let you know that we will be recording today's uh, AMA. Um, and we can share that with the attendees afterwards, and that will be posted for your viewing pleasure afterwards. Um, and if you have any questions, we encourage you to please type those into the chat box, and we'll make sure to try to get to as many as possible at the end of today's AMA. Um, and we also have a raise hand feature, so if you have uh, anything that you wanted uh, the, uh, the panelists to, to chat about a little bit more, feel free to raise your hand, and we can uh, you know, make sure that we pause and, and give a little bit more on um, whatever the discussion topic is at the time. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Carrie McKinney, who's our host for today, who can introduce herself as well as Darren Murph. Take it away, Carrie. Thank you. You had me muted, I couldn't unmute. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining. Um, as Ryan said, I'm Carrie McKinney. I am the Director of Global Sourcing at Terminal. I've um, been working remote and managing remote teams for over 10 years. Um, really excited to be here today with um, Darren Murph, the head of remote for our uh, GitLab, who is going to be um, giving us a whirlwind of exciting uh, tips working remote. But Darren, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? He's muted too. <laughs> He's stuck. <laughs> Just so. hold on one second. Dorian is like yeah. the almighty power of controlling the mic. There we there go. There we go. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Dorian. And thank you for all that are attending. Yep. So I'm Darren, head of remote at GitLab. So if you're not aware, GitLab makes a DevOps platform delivered as a single application but we also are the world's largest all remote company so we have over 1200 people across more than 65 countries no offices at all even our executive team works from their respective homes i've worked remotely my entire career in co-located spaces hybrid remote companies and now at gitlab all remote so i've learned a lot remote has evolved quite a bit uh, and almost overnight millions of people are now remote it's not the ideal situation for remote. Crisis-driven work from home is definitely not the same as an intentional remote structure. But nevertheless, people are in this boat and we're doing what we can to inform and educate them and help to stabilize their remote situation while their company builds the infrastructure for this to be a meaningful part of their operational strategy going forward. Thank you. Okay, I'm just not going to mute myself anymore. Thanks, yeah. Darren. <laughs> uh, I don't know what keeps happening. Um, well, we're super excited to have you here today. Um, we had quite a few questions uh, submitted, but let's just get right into it. Um, you know, you gave us a little bit of an overview about GitLab, um, but what really makes GitLab a remote um, first company? You know, when it comes to like your policies and your your culture, like what do you think really sets you guys apart? Yeah, so GitLab was remote from the very start. Our three co-founders were in three different countries, and so they had no choice but to just use the internet to work. And they actually got an office briefly out of Y Combinator, because that's just what you do. Uh, and after about three days, everyone stopped showing up because it was unnecessary. We make a purely digital product. We communicate digitally. Why waste time on the commute? So we were very fortunate that the initial founding team was very amenable to remote. But the key thing that we did early on that makes it possible to scale to over 1200 people is our value of documentation and how important documentation is to us. And you'll often hear documentation is important for remote teams and that's true, but it's a bit dangerous to just say document and give no construct to what you mean by that. So GitLab actually works handbook first, which we can talk about in a bit. But essentially all of our processes were documented from day one. We now have a public handbook that is over 5,000 pages if you printed it out with all of our processes uh, and all of our cultural norms and values and everything is written down. 
And because of that, it allows 1,200 people to consult a single source of truth all at once. You don't have to virtually tap someone on the shoulder. Everyone knows where the most current version of every process that we adhere to is, and that's in the handbook. So documentation in a meaningfully structured way has made it easy for us to, to scale this remote team. That's great. And, you know, I'm curious, how often, you know, you're, the company has been around for a, a, quite a while. How often do you guys look at these policies and the documents and, you know, update them to make sure that people have the right information at the right time? Yeah, so, so it's a fundamentally different way of thinking about everything. So very often in HR, for example, you'll have a handbook which lays out things like policies and what we need people to sign off on and term harassment policies and all of that. And it's something that's looked at once a year. So it's valid from January 1 to December 31, and then maybe we'll look at it again and we'll update it for the year. So at GitLab, everything is a living, breathing, evolving organism, including our values page. And we host our handbook using GitLab, the product, which supports continuous integration and continuous delivery. So anyone at any time, anyone in the company or even outside of the company can make a merge request within GitLab to update any part of the handbook. And this happens on a daily basis. We have dozens and dozens of handbook changes every single day. And then that merge request goes to the code owner, whoever is, is responsible for that section of the site. So for example, if you made a proposal to change something in our finance handbook, the controller or the CFO would need to approve that or look at it or adjust it, but anyone is empowered to make that change. And because we empower everyone to make proposals to make our handbook better, everyone is really invested in it. Everyone believes in it. It's never stagnant. And I think it would be harder to scale a handbook if you treat it like a wiki where only the executives lay down the rules of the road and you don't give other people the, the feedback mechanism to improve it or add to it. That's just a part of our culture. We bake that in from the very beginning. Um, and, it's, and it's quite empowering. Of course, you can't just directly make a change to the handbook, but you right. empower anyone to make a proposal to it. And then you trust the DRI, the code owner of that section, to make the change or edit it or ask you for more input. That's great. No, I, I think definitely can see how that's very empowering to employees. Um, so let's dive into remote work strategies. A lot of people these days have kind of been thrown into remote work. Um, and I think you and I could both agree that there's a difference between working from home all the time and working from home COVID times. Um, but regardless, what are some strategies that you think can be implemented right now, um, you know, short term versus long term on how companies can really build out that uh, remote first culture? Yeah, so uh, for, the, for the folks in attendance here, I'm actually going to chat out uh, or add to chat a couple of guides that I've stood up on this. And for those listening uh, after the fact, if you go to allremote.info, you'll see the remote playbook that we've put together. And so all of what I'm about to say is in that form. And you're, you're welcome to download it and you're welcome to share the links there. Thank I really you. have five Great. tips for the, for, the, for the here and now. And the first is establish a remote leadership team. So there's a lot of nuance in remote. You have to open up new communication channels. You have to be, be very prescriptive about things, even informal communication or how people build bonds. You don't really have to put any framework around that in an office building. It just sort of spontaneously happens. So leaders get away with not having to be intentional about it. You now need to be intentional about that. You're also going to have people that are in foreign places with using tools and software that they might not be familiar with. Maybe they have to VPN in, which is new for them. You have to provide a feedback mechanism so that they can give you feedback on what's working and what's not working. So this is something that's brand new. And unless you have a remote leadership team, there's going to be an accountability issue on like, who is responsible for managing this feedback and prioritizing what to fix first. So that's the first one. The second is establish a handbook. I mentioned this about how important the handbook is for us. And it can be very rudimentary. It can be a single page in, a, in Notion or Ask Almanac where you can use GitLab pages. Just start it as an FAQ to begin with. If you don't have a handbook or something that resembles one, just start something and advise people on where to turn, who is the DRI for access requests, things like that. And day after day, that handbook will become deeper and deeper and deeper. And in a few months, you'll have a really robust repository and a single source of truth for people to turn to. The third thing is establish a communications plan. The first thing to fail in our newly remote environment is communications. They get siloed, they get fractured, 
Some people have heard something, but not the whole team. So you need to be very transparent about everything, be very vulnerable, and also be very prescriptive about where informal communication happens, where work communication happens, what email is for, what Slack is for, what your asynchronous tools are for. These are things that you can kind of get away with not being prescriptive about it in an office because people can tap each other on the shoulder or they can just have an ad hoc meeting to bridge any communication gaps. Remote forces you to be intentional about it because those gaps are a lot harder to just band-aid over. And this is gonna add discipline to your team, which isn't a bad thing. It's just gonna be tough in the here and now. The fourth thing is minimize your tool stack. Your people have a lot of chaos right now. The world around them is, has changed. They're working in their home, which might not be ideally suited for remote work. They need to iterate on that as well. The last thing you wanna do is introduce more and more tools, new things to learn, unless you absolutely have to. And I actually encourage people to take a look at the tools you are using and see if there are new ways to use them. So a good example here is if you use Office 365 or Google Documents and G Suite, people have access to Google Docs and they may just use them as a scratch pad. But what GitLab does is we append a Google Doc to every meeting that acts as an agenda. So people document their questions in advance, they document it in real time during the meeting, and then there's always that takeaway that you can share around to your team and the broader company so people have context even if they weren't able to be in the meeting. And this is a very simple process change. And it's just using Google Docs, which we were already using, in a new way. So it's, it's, a, it's half about the tools, but half about the process and the way you use them. And that meeting example gets you one step closer to remote fluency. If you just start doing that tomorrow and make your meetings more documented, there will be less knowledge gaps and more people can contribute asynchronously. And you'll add a lot of efficiency and seamlessness just by doing something simple like that. The last thing is driving change. Cultural change is a major, a major part of this. A lot of people may have signed up for a co-located role and now suddenly they're remote and they're not going to love it. A lot of people want to be in an office and they're going to just begrudgingly be a part of a remote team. So you have to just be willing to listen to that and understand that and lead with empathy. I've seen some leaders that their first thought is, well, I need to invent new rules and new ways to micromanage. That is unadvised. Uh, that, is, that is a good way to incite burnout. It's a good way to ensure that your, your team is looking elsewhere. It may seem counterintuitive, but the further away your team is from that centralized office, the more you need to empower them and entrust them and give them the autonomy to actually feedback to you as a leader what the reality is of their day. And if ever there was a time for servant leadership, this is now the time. And that's not, it doesn't come naturally for a lot of leaders, but on the whole, I would say start there. Don't start from the place of micromanagement and be willing to transparently admit to the team that look, this is, this is change. Going remote is not a binary switch that you flip. It is a journey, it's a process, and it's filled with iteration. You get better at it every day as long as the team is invested in communicating with each other on making that process better. Yep. I completely agree. And I love what you said about um, micromanaging because I, I think that if you set clear goals that kind of helps you get away from the micromanaging when remote, but you're going to lose people if you try to micromanage. Yeah. And the goals thing is, is vital. Um, I've, I've actually heard, how will I know they were working? And my, yeah. my response to that is, truthfully, if you hire adults and give them great metrics, you're probably going to have the opposite problem, if, if anything, where people are just going to overwork because there's not that natural indication yep. of the day is over, I'm walking out of a door, so therefore I'm not working anymore. <clears throat> and so you actually have to be more cognizant of, are my people on a road to burnout? Are they actually working too much? Do they need to take more breaks? Um, and for leaders that are concerned that productivity will dip, the truth is what's happening right now is not normal remote work. And so you actually should expect some productivity hits. A lot of parents have kids home from school that they just took on yeah. a second part-time job as an educator. I mean, things are different right now. You should be yeah. empathetic and understanding about that. But even when you get back to normal, it's on the leader to give super clear metrics 
on what you expect from each individual person. There can be no ambiguity, no subjectivity. These are things that you can kind of get away with in an office, but it's on the leader to figure out what is the metric and have that conversation with someone and then give them the metric, give them the, the desired outcome and then let them get there in any way they see fit. That is yeah. maximum empowerment and that's actually taking advantage of the remote structure instead of being burdened by the typical office environment. Yeah, completely agree. Um, okay, being cognizant of time, I wanna get into some of the questions that were pre-submitted. Um, and one thing I wanna touch base with you on is, um, we've talked a little bit about it, but how should the people function at different companies be evolving? You know, What do they need to be doing differently? What do they need to be doing the same of um, right now to keep up with what's going on? I would say leaders of people, chief HR officers, chief people officers, this, this is an amazing opportunity to, uh, you know, in an absence of leadership lead. And your people more than ever need intentionality on almost everything that you kind of took for granted. Isolation is a big question. People don't understand how to kind of copy the energy and vibe they had from people in an office and paste it into a virtual world. Uh, but actually the opportunities are even more significant in a remote setting. So an example there is last week we had 135 people on our marketing team on one Zoom call for a talent show that was established two weeks prior. We had people, 29 people, I think, sign up in the agenda doc to showcase a talent. And one of them, there was a gentleman in his kitchen, actually, like flames coming up, very Gordon Ramsay-esque, uh, just an amazing array of talents across the world. And we had a, a panel of judges at the end and the prizes were given out. And we were all able to just bond over laughs and crazy genius talents that no one knew that each other had, that's fundamentally impossible to do in an office. So you can bond even more tightly with a remote team. But here's the thing, someone had to be intentional about structuring that. So the people ops had to be intentional about meeting with our respective department leaders and saying, what can we put on the calendar to give people an opportunity to hang out, to be together, to, to connect as humans first and colleagues second. And then for people that are the, the, the direct reports that are kind of on the other side of this, like all of a sudden I'm working from home. I would say the best advice I have is to try to create some sort of physical separation between where work happens in your home and where life happens. And if you're in a small one, one bedroom apartment, even if you have a makeshift type of curtain arrangement, um, ask your company to invest in things like noise canceling headphones, a more ergonomic setup, whatever you can do to clearly separate work and life will go a long way. And for people that are used to having a commute, let's say 45 minutes each way, proactively plan what you're going to do, how you're going to recapture that commute time and actually put it in your calendar with a notification that pops up to remind you to do it. This could be anything from, uh, I'm going to spend that 45 minutes interfacing with my child. I'm going to spend that time walking the dog. I'm going to spend that time exercising, reading, learning something new, sleeping more, totally cool to get more rest as long as it's very intentional but do something with it. It helps you ramp into your day and ramp out of your day. Otherwise you run the risk of sleep, work, sleep, work. It just becomes this nonstop blur and that's an early, early path for burnout and you wanna do whatever you can to avoid that. Yep, I agree. I think you, I keep hearing this, the theme um, being intentional, but I think it's so important to reiterate that because when you're working from home, sometimes your day can just feel like a big blob. So you have to be intentional about how you're spending your time. Um, so another really interesting question that I'm, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on, um, you've obviously been working remote for a long time, but how, um, how can companies who are used to working in a, in headquarters and now they're, you know, moving to fully distributed, how do you think about building remote teams? The best way to approach this is to document what it is to work at your company. And this is a forcing exercise, but it helps leaders get really real with themselves. So if you go to the GitLab Jobs FAQ page, there's a section there that I wrote called, what's it like to work at GitLab? And I would actually encourage any recruiting team, any leadership team to write that down and answer it honestly. What is it like to work at your company? And what is it like going forward now that there's a remote element to it? What does it involve? What does culture look like? What does day-to-day -day look like? If you can't write that out and distill it as a leadership team, how could you ever expect new hires or even existing hires to understand it either? 
So I think it starts at the top with writing that down. I mean, I know that sounds super rudimentary and simple, but if you write that down, it gives potential applicants a bird's eye view of what it is like to work there. And we actually want people to opt into the unique ways that GitLab works. We want to be super transparent about our vision, our strategy, and what it's like to work here because it's respectful of your time as a potential applicant. If you read that and you know that that's not where you're going to thrive, we've just saved you a lot of time going through the application process. We've actually made our recruiting pipeline a lot more pure. So the people that do apply, they did so very intentionally. No one accidentally ends up at GitLab. And you wanna create that type of pipeline for your company as well. And now is an amazing opportunity to think about, we have to put these remote best practices in place just for business continuity. But we might as well do it in a way that this actually helps us get to the future where work is less geographically dependent. And it now enables us to fill certain roles, even roles that we can't even imagine yet, by tapping into the world's best talent instead of bringing them to one city or another. That makes sense. It's kind of a follow-up question to that. What do, what do you think is the most common mistake that companies make when pivoting to remote work? One of two things, one being let's double down on command and control. Let's make even more rules where we restrict people's movements. And so there's a fine line between more rules and more intentionality. I actually think it's a great idea to be very intentional about where communication happens because that's obvious that it, it improves the, the greater good of everyone. But if it, if it starts veering into um, the privacy side of things, like, hey, we're gonna put software on your computer that tracks your keystrokes and we're gonna turn on your webcam every 30 minutes just to make sure you're still there that is dehumanizing, that's disempowering. And so I would say lean into the empowering and autonomy side of that and open up feedback mechanisms for people to be honest with you about what they need to thrive in a remote setting. Because obviously that isn't what they were hired into. So now it's almost like a reset, a re-onboarding of, hey, tell us what you need. We understand that your office environment has dramatically changed. Um, I think the, the other is, it's just the assumption that things are gonna go back to normal. I'm not gonna really worry about it. I'm not gonna put mm -hmm. any effort into, into doing this differently. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't think there's really any putting this genie back into the bottle. And it, to me, it just comes back to having an abundance mindset versus a scarcity mindset. This is a tragic situation to get here, but it's here. And it's your, it's your chance to handle it one way or the other. And so I would look at all elements of the business now is the time and restructure it with an abundance mindset of what is possible now if we can hire remotely or we decouple geography and work, what can we do with that? That's great. That's actually a great segue into a question we just got. Um, so after COVID-19 passes and a new normal is established, how do you think that will affect executive thinking about the global talent pool as a forcing function to think about recruiting? it's gonna change everything, it already has. <clears throat> Businesses are already understanding that the closer they are to remote, the more they de-risk their business. For example, no one in the UK saw Brexit coming, but any London-based company now is permanently impacted by something that has nothing to do with their business. So just because they happen to be based in London, now they have to deal with this. And then you see this global crisis where if you had a business based in Wuhan or Milan or any of these these tier three type of places that, that COVID has impacted, you're more negatively impacted than somewhere else, Iowa City, for example. Yeah. And so business leaders are saying, you know, we can actually de-risk our business by decoupling geography and work. So the, the closer we can get to all remote, it's less risk for our business. I think this has actually been, um, a lot of recruiters have been leaning into this for a long time. And this is, yeah kind of the forcing function and the, you know, the global reset, the global moment to say, okay, I needed a catalyst and mm -hmm. I've got it. Because it is actually really, really difficult for companies, especially startups and smaller companies to recruit top talent to a certain place where the competition is already incredibly fierce. And then if you do manage to get them there, now that they've moved their entire family there and they've, they've cleared that hurdle, 
if a larger company comes along with a much better role or a much better paycheck, they're gone immediately. So your retention is destroyed and you took six months just to get them there and now they're immediately gone somewhere else. You have this flywheel effect, just this terrible negative flywheel effect. Conversely, GitLab's the voluntary retention rate is north of 85%, which is stratospheric compared to almost anything else. And that's because we hire people that value autonomy and the ability to live and work wherever their soul is most fulfilled more than salary and job title and prestige and ego, the usual. I say that remote is the last great competitive advantage for recruiters. If you lead with the fact that this role is remote, we just care about how awesome you are and the results that you deliver. We're going to empower you to do that from wherever you want, even if it changes on a weekly or monthly basis. What an amazing place to start that conversation from. Yeah. So you Good as pitch. a company, I mean, the image of that, the employee branding side of that, it, yeah. the relationship starts from a much better place than, honestly, we don't really trust you to do this anywhere other than here. That's how most job conversations start. So if you just don't do that, you're already miles ahead of the game. Yep. And that ties into the culture of the whole company too. I think that sets the stage for what the culture is like during the hiring process once you kind of join. Um, go ahead. Were you going to say? Add something? The only thing I was going to say is even if you're dealing with people that, that say, you know, my home isn't amenable to work from home. I actually love the energy and buzz. You can fix that too. GitLab will reimburse people for working at co-working spaces or external offices. And about a fifth of our company takes us up on it. So about a fifth of our company actually leaves their home every day, goes to a coffee shop, goes to a co-working space, somewhere where there can be other people around them. So we just say that you don't have to work from home. There's just no office to commute to. And honestly, yeah. during COVID days, even that fifth of the company, they're experiencing something more akin to the rest of the world because they are now forced back into their home, which was not their preferred place of work either. Well, we are, have about 30 seconds left. Um, we had a few other questions, but is there anything else that you want to add? This has been so helpful and I even have takeaways that I'm ready to implement. No, I'm glad. Uh, we're continuously building out our library of remote resources. Again, that's allremote.info. And if you look down there, you'll see links to how we do asynchronous, how we do meetings, how we do hiring, compensation, all of that. So go check that out. There's a lot there. Um, we try to cross link amongst them. So hopefully you'll find something that's useful, but I just do want to close and say there's a lot of, of negativity and crisis in the world right now, but the second order of this, I think is actually quite positive. I think we're going to look back a year from now and we're going to realize that a lot of companies laid remote infrastructure that they knew they needed to, but wouldn't have otherwise done. And I think it's going to give people permission to actually look beyond where they currently are, maybe relocate to a smaller place, a more rural place with better air quality, higher quality of living, better schools yeah. for their children, and actually reduce some of the strain on some of the major urban centers of the world, like the New Yorks and San Francisco's of the world, or even their public transit systems are, are crippled right now because of how many people that are there. And a lot of the people that do call that home have been displaced by people that are only there because of work. So I actually think that the, the future is really bright uh, and it's all on us as remote advocates to make sure that people thrive in remote uh, and they aren't stuck. And we need to be open and transparent with each other on the challenges that we're facing because we're all living this in real time. And I think if we do this right, this is a fundamental societal shift in how we view work. And uh, I'm excited for the future that's to come. Me too. Well, thank you, Darren. Um, this was great. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we'll get this recording up. Um, thanks again for your time. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Cheers all. Be well.